we're, we're um hence is why we're uh going no 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 kids we have so we're supposed to go on a cruise you know and you love your kids i know i love our yes it's, it's yeah okay. eight uh six months they've been there beth ann six months they've been at our house yeah. um <laughs> but it's the group that we were going to go on the cruise with and um it just so happens that we the church and God of Christ, you're not supposed to be in a nightclub. Simple as that. A lot of people felt as if the music was being played outside Hey, Dan. Hey, Deputy Mayor Mahoney, how are you? Good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. No more snow. Snow's going to be deep this weekend. Hush. <laughs> Maybe here. <laughs> Michael says, isn't it like really raining in Florida? I said, no, that's in Texas. I'm not going there. <laughs> I got to make sure my avalanche beacon is fully charged for this weekend. <laughs> You're hilarious. So Matt said he might be a few minutes late. Uh, Matt Pina um, is on his way here. So, yeah, I JC, try my best not to be late. Yeah, and I just let JC in, so we have a quorum at least, but you know. I know I'll be like, oh no, I gotta log on. The meeting's gonna start. <laughs> All right. Hey, JC, we're gonna try to give five minute delay. Uh, Matt's in route to the city right now to log on.
I could play the Jeopardy music. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anybody watching Jeopardy? With um, the new guy. Yeah, the new guy, Ken Jennings. Yeah, I'm yeah. waiting for the one with Aaron Rodgers. Apparently, is he going host, to guest host? He's going to guest host like for a week or something. I think. Oh, I heard Katie Cork was going to as well. Yeah, there's a few of them. I think they're changing it up. You know, try and try them out. I think the then, the guy that's a sports better that was on there. He didn't win as much as Ken Jennings. I, I thought he'd be a good host. He's kind of got an attitude and oh, that one young kid. That, yeah, he, um, he like that just big, goes always crazy. Of like dollars. Mm -hmm. They had that trio when they were all uh, tournament of champions or whatever. I'm not. I don't mean I don't get any of the questions right. Don't get me wrong. I do really well when it's like kid Jeopardy, and I barely get half of them correct. <laughs> yeah, I, I might be okay with college Jeopardy, yeah. but man, I'll tell you. I'm not sure, you know, you should know that much trivial information, you know, if your head's full of that, it's, you probably need to get a, a life or a hobby. <laughs> well, no, there's some people who are just gifted in that and I'm not, yeah, true, them, true. Know, retain all that information or just know stuff. That's not my deal. I hardly remember my name half the time. So, you know, we're really lucky. I'm even right here. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's been a long week. Bear with me. Solid job on the the plowing i mean that was wild wind and weather you talk about drifts and spots and then nothing in others yeah but in general you know the main corridors and routes were pretty good um didn't look like people were really trying to go anywhere which i think was good it happened on a weekend yeah the weekend helped us uh, uh, I knew, you know, I, I knew every now and again we'd get snow and sometimes we'd get, you know, deeper snow than others, but drifting snow. Now, I never thought I'd say that for Des Moines. I mean, yeah, it was, it was two and a half feet deep and a hundred feet down the road there. It was bare pavement. It was crazy. We were just watching it and it looked like I watched different parts of town lose power um, here and there for windows of time and then come back on and oh look what the cat drug in <laughs> how did he get in here <laughs> who made him chair of the committee yeah got through the firewall we were uh we're waiting a few minutes matt should be logging on here pretty quick he was in route to get to so we're gonna start it. We're gonna kick off at 3.05. We'll still make our time. I guess- uh, How are you, Dave? Pretty good. I keep bouncing from meeting to meeting to meeting. <laughs> I just got off yeah. uh, the Economic uh, Development uh, Partnership uh, 2021 grant uh, program uh, kickoff that uh, Eric was uh, just speaking to the uh, I think the drone flyover or something that you're talking about doing for promotional for the uh, marina redevelopment. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Isn't it uh, tiring just going from one Zoom meeting to another to another? My record so far is I think 13 meetings in one day. So. In one day? Yeah, there's oh. overlap. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to drop off sometimes depending you're upon- Coming out of one and- I'm getting on there too yeah. between Nordstrom and this and some of the stuff happening during the day, it's not un uncommon to get 12 or 13. That's crazy. Well, um, let's, uh, JC, if you don't mind, I think we could probably go ahead and uh, approve the minutes uh, with a motion because there's at least two of us here. Do you have anything that's changed on the minutes or? No, that's, that's fine. I move to approve the minutes of the January Transportation Committee meeting. Okay, and I'm gonna second that. So the minutes are approved. Yeah. And then um, <clears throat> we might as well- Matt's on his way in. So. Matt, right there, perfect timing, look at that. Okay. Hey. Yeah, it's perfect timing, but I'm here, so. Yeah. All right, Matt, we already proved the minutes just a second ago. 
Okay. And you know, we're going to get right into the uh, capital improvement project updates. Sounds great. Oh, wait, we're going to do the sound. I'm sorry, my, my mistake. We're going to do the sound transit update Sounds first. Good. And then we'll go into that. So with that, which one of you is going to take that? I'm going to take the sound transit update. OK, great. Well, good afternoon, uh, committee members, council members. Um, just want to give a brief update on where how things are going on the sound transit project. Um, at this point, when you look at the uh, project-wide, the corridor-wide um, design contract, uh, the des overall design is about 25% complete. But in Des Moines specifically, we're we're north of 90% complete on the design elements. So we're 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 gaining on uh, on that. You know, it's a design build, so they they design it and they start building before the design is complete. Um, kind of a special uh, contracting uh, that we're using on this project. So we've made good progress on the design um, elements within Des Moines and, um, and everything's going smoothly with between us and, and Sound Transit and Kiwit by and large. We've got a few little squabbles we're wrestling over, but um, more technical detail kind of stuff, but um, it's going well. Heavy construction um, started last July after some of the utility prep and site work was uh, got completed from 2019. Um, the plan that they'll start, at this point, they'll start placing some noise walls later this year in Des Moines. Um, that's currently on the schedule. Um, this, and we'll get into the work at 216th here in a minute, but um, so heavy construction is underway and I'm gonna show you some pictures and stuff here in a few minutes on that. Um, in fact, at the Kent Des Moines station, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Uh, let's see how this works. Let's see here. Can you all see that? There. Yep. Okay. So here is um, here is the Kent Des Moines uh, station area, and this is kind of looking southwest. You can see. The first TOD development on the project right there in Des Moines, the Highline, uh, Highline Place uh, development in the distance there. But um, this is where you the light rail would be coming into the uh, KDM station from the north. So um, this one, one view. And then um, let's see here. Here's another, here's another image. Can you guys see this second image here? Still the still the first one. Okay, let me uh, minimize that. Hmm. Wonder why that's not working. Oh, there we go. I guess I have to click the new share button. Yay! Yep. That one. Okay. So this is just a different angle from the uh, of the station area. So you can kind of see the two the twin columns there. So obviously one one set of the columns is for the northbound track, and the other one's for the southbound trains where they would uh, come off here. So probably within the next few weeks, you're going to start to see a tower crane um, coming in coming up at the KDM station. And uh, so they'll be starting to go vertical here on the next in the coming months on that on that station area at, at Kent Des Moines Station. So pretty exciting to see that. At this point, they have about 30 of the 121 drilled shafts completed. So they're about 25% the way through with the drilled shafts. Um, you know, as with with the drilled shaft work that we've done on projects, you know, uh, that's where a lot of risk is involved uh, in the project. Um, so uh, they're about 25% done with that, uh, which is good news. Um, one of the major milestones that if you've driven on Highway 99 here recently, you've seen the completion of the bypass route up in the city of SeaTac. Um, and so that that's kind of a partnership with Sound Transit and WashDOT to construct the bridge uh, on Highway 99 as part of this project. I'm going to show you 
try to show you a video of this here. Let me see if I can do this real quick. Let's see here. Let me make sure I get the right one. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. I hope I don't crash the whole system here, but. You guys see that? Yeah. This is drone image. Um, it's a little choppy, but we're getting the idea. Yeah, we got the idea though. <clears throat> oh boy. Okay, well that's enough of that. Uh, could you? Hopefully, you could see that. It didn't work very well. Minimizing impacts to the Midway landfill and McSorley Creek wetland. That was good. Um, All right, done with the videos. That didn't work very well. Anyway, uh, I'll forward you guys that video. As you, if you kind of st pause that video as you're playing, as it plays through, it's a one minute long video. You can see in the background, 28th, 24th over in the city of SeaTac. And you can actually see the bridge that was constructed on that project where 509 is going underneath 28th, 24th. And so as you kind of pause the video at the right spot, you can really get a sense of where 509 is going to be going right next to the sound transit work. Um, so, and, and in that video, you can see where they're doing the drilled shaft work along there. So uh, they're making really good progress up in SeaTac on that uh, area there. As far as the permitting goes on our project, um, we have just about issued all the permits for the building related work in Des Moines. We have one, one permit that we're still working some details out on and that's for the Newport Village um, uh, multifamily, um, I guess it's condos, apartments. So anyway, we're working through some details on that. Uh, most of the uh, permits that have been issued, buildings have, a lot of the demo work has been completed already uh, in Des Moines. Um, so the Newport Village, once we sort out some of the details there, they will get started on, on some demo there. We're, the building that they plan to demo has already been vacated. We are having um, a few code enforcement related trespassing calls. We've been working with Corey and the Sound Transit uh, security folks and Kiwit security folks to uh, deal with that issue. Uh, we're hoping to issue the permit um, sometime late next week. And so sometime within the next couple of weeks, we'll see that that building being uh, demolished on that site. Okay. The 216th undercrossing, um, that work is scheduled to occur this summer, probably in the July timeframe. Um, we've been working out um, some final details on, on the, the backfill uh, that's going to go in with that with that project. Again, this is work that's scheduled to take place over a quote long weekend. Uh, it's probably going to take about four days, plus the nights on each end of that. So, um, what they're plan to do is to actually construct the tunnel um, in advance on on one side, and then when they close and excavate what's remaining under that part of two sixteenth, they're actually going to drag the tunnel into place. Um, so I'm hoping that we can put up a uh, time-lapse camera and kind of really get a sense over those four days of that work. It'll really be something to, to watch. But we've been arguing over dirt, believe it or not, um, with Sound Transit and Kiwit. Um, Andrew's been doing a great job making sure that the dirt that gets put back under the road when they're done is the right kind of dirt that's not going to um, settle over time. And so we have, we have really been going to the mat 
over the kind of dirt that's going to be put back in there. So I really got to hand it to Andrew, the, who's towing the line um, on that. So I think we've come to some resolution on that, and we should be able to wrap that up here soon um, on that part of the tunnel. Fierce negotiator, that Andrew. Yeah, he's uh, the mud wrestler, I guess we could call him. I don't know. Hey, Dan, yep. is there any word on the maintenance facility? Uh, I think, what are we, in March or April is the public comment on the the three sites? Is that where yeah. we're at on that? Yeah, I've got that, I've got that on my uh, agenda here to update. Oh, of course. On. Great segue, right? So just a couple of other points. Um, you know, Sound Transit's been doing a good job um, from our perspective, reaching out to the community. They continue to have neighborhood briefings, uh, uh, via Zoom, they've been having um, some things like that. A lot of flyers on the door. They've, um, they've got a, a team now that's helping resolve issues that come up on the project. Jefferson Rose, who I think you all have met, has been doing a fantastic job. Very responsive when, when, when we've had calls from the neighborhoods, they, they get right on it. Um, I'll be honest with you. I, I have not had very many complaints. We've had a few, but way far less than I thought we would have. And I think it's uh, Sound Transit and Kiwit uh, together have really been proactive in trying to address some of the potential issues where we'd get um, complaints. So um, we are continuing to work through some design efforts on the landscaping buffer, uh, tree replacements, um, offsite mitigation within Des Moines. We're working through that with Kiwit. Sound Transit and, and Des Moines are aligned on what needs to be done. Kiwit is uh, balking a little bit, but Sound, um, Sound Transit is aligned with us and our position on what needs to be done. And there's nothing um, that's unexpected here. It's just kind of contract negotiating kind of things. So we'll get to where we need to get to on that. And uh, our community development staff has been really helpful in, in um, uh, um, helping Kiwit to understand our position based on our code. So that's been that's been really good. Um, and then uh, the the work on the Highline College parking lot is going well. You know we've got an agreement between us and the college, um, and so we've completed a lot of the design work on that. There's a few details to sort out on that yet, but we're very close and construction on that's likely to happen next summer, summer of 2022. Um, so we have plenty of time, but a lot of the details are starting to get sorted out on that as well. So as Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor Mahoney uh, mentioned on March 5th, I believe the, the draft EIS for the operation and maintenance facility south will be issued. Uh, there's three sites that they've been looking at. One is the uh, Midway, old Midway landfill site. Uh, the other two sites are in um, Federal Way. And so they'll be uh, issuing that for public comment. Um, and so we will be reviewing that uh, and providing comment um, um, for what's in the EIS, but some will also be commenting to, to make sure that some of the uh, pre-screened sites don't get reselected. Uh, we were opposed to uh, one of the sites early on, which was right on the corner of 240th and Pacific Highway South, where they were proposing the, to put the maintenance facility right where the lows uh, take the lows out and we, we objected to that. It didn't meet the vision midway design standards, uh, the stuff and the work we'd, uh, we've been planning for Pacific Highway South for many years. So we wanna make sure that some of those things don't get, um, don't come back to the surface as part of the EIS work. Um, for primarily we'll be looking at stormwater and traffic kind of impacts. We'll be looking at other kinds of impacts, but those are two areas where we're going to be paying particular close attention to the site at the Midway landfill area. Um, and we'll be coordinating with City of Kent and the college on that as well. So they're aware that it's coming. We're, we're prepared. Um, 
within our work schedules to to dive into that. We'll have uh, 45 days to review that, so that's going to be plenty of time uh, to, to complete that. So that completes my update. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those yeah. now. Dan, I've got three hopefully really quick ones. Um, so regarding tree replacement, are is the negotiation going to follow like the three to one thing that's in the um, city's policy? And yeah, is there like yeah. a place where they're going to go or? Well, um, yes, the, they have to do a three to one for every tree they took down. Um, we have agreement with um, between the city, Sound Transit and Kiwit on the number. Um, and I'm going to round it. It's a it's basically a thousand trees, and I'm rounding it to you know it's right in that neighborhood. Um, it's a thousand trees that they have to replace. Uh, what we're arguing over is um, Kiwit feels that the landscape buffer should account for some of those replacement trees, and we're saying no. The landscape buffer is in addition to those thousand trees. Thank you for that. Um, that's our code interpretation. Sound Transit agrees with that. Kiwit does not. So that's where we're at. We're negotiating that. And it's this is a big deal. This is big money and they know it and that's why they're disagreeing with it. Um, we've estimated that um, if they were to just write a check for those thousand trees, it'd probably be about $750,000 that they'd pay to the city's tree mitigation um, fund uh, we're you know they have the the right contractually to to replace those trees along the guideway corridor within des moines which is fine if they can find place to plant a thousand trees that's what they would do um, you know our goal would be hopefully if they write a check we would find property in pacific ridge to augment the landscape buffer in areas and, and recreate a buffer where we can so uh, that those conversations will come once the check lands at the city. That's going to be a while yet until we get through this discussion on the, the landscape buffer versus mitigation. So that's where we're at with that. Uh, um, thank you. So second quick question um, is, does the city have a position as to which of the three sites for the maintenance facility you are supporting? Uh, we don't have a position I mean, are you advocating for the midway for the landfill site? It's, it sounded like you were. No, uh, essentially when we review the EIS um, the, at the staff level, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we would not, you know, we would not say one way or another which site we would prefer. That's a council decision. We would basically evaluate the sites uh, for to make sure that um, Sound Transit adequately um, identified the impacts to the environment and then that any mitigation that they proposed was adequate. Um, um, so the third thing. Well, uh, one, just one second. We'll, yeah. we, we're going to pay more attention to the Midway landfill site than we will to the Federal Way sites, just to be honest, because the federal way sites are so far removed from our agency, uh, it, right. the impacts to us are going to be minor. So we're going to be focusing on the Midway site. Um, and uh, But we are going to look at the other uh, other sites, but not, not as in-depth as we are the Midway site. So Makes perfect sense. Um, so the third thing, and this is a trivia question, I um, how deep are the columns below grade? I mean, it, it, yeah. It depends. It depends on the quality of the dirt. Um, but to give you an idea, when we did a couple of shafts at the South Twin Bridge um, for seismic retrofitting, they were 60 feet deep. And you, you want to talk about when you walk up to a six foot diameter shaft, 60 feet deep, and look down in that thing. It's a long it, way. It knocked the wind out of you. I, I, I'm asking because, I mean, I've just, my understanding is that a great deal of the entire area was like swamp, you know, uh, before white people showed up and so on. And so I'm always just curious as to how unstable the geology is in the area. 
So thank you. Yeah, I know that um, much of the area has pretty good soils. I know they did a lot of geotechnical borings at each each location where the shafts were going to go. They have a lot of geotechnical data. The most challenging area was actually at the Midway landfill site where they actually excavated a lot of the old garbage and, and moved it because they didn't actually I take that well they did do some of that but they instead of going aerially they actually put the guideway at grade because they didn't want to drill shafts through that garbage and you know hit an old Volkswagen or hit you know something underneath there so uh, that was a really big concern and so they that was one of the ATCs that Kiwit proposed was to put that at grade. Um, so anyway. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. You have any questions before we move on to the CIP update? All right, let's move on to the CIP update. <clears throat> All right, good evening, council and committee members. Uh, this is Andrew Murgis. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. I know Jody was having some issues with that today. Uh, so yeah, really quick on the CIP update. I know we talked about this last month, but I'll run through. There's been a couple of changes and a couple of highlights I wanna kind of talk about. So kind of as we did before, going kind of top to bottom and feel free to jump in with any questions uh, that you may have along the way here. So South 216th Street, segment three, we finally closed out the project with our grant partner, uh, the Transportation Improvement Board. So that project is pretty much buttoned up. Uh, the downtown alleyway project waiting final paving. Typically that will happen uh, April uh, into May when the paving windows start opening up again. The 2019 arterial street paving, that's the interlocal agreement with Highline Water District for the North Hill uh, AC water main replacement projects. Uh, that will probably, uh, all those roads will be paved uh, most likely April, May as well too up there. The 24th and 208th intersection improvement project, uh, we're working with the contractor to find hopefully a time in uh, March to get the signal up and running, get the roadway channelization completed. We just need kind of a week of dry weather. And so far it's been uh, elusive to get a full week of dry weather lately on that one, but still, still in progress on that. The uh, North Marina parking lot and bulkhead restroom replacement project, uh, as I mentioned last week in the council meeting update. All the permits have been issued and now we're just completing design and trying to hit a project advertisement uh, for public bids in April is my goal on that one. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the Redondo Fishing Pier for now. I'll leave that one for the last. Uh, the arterial traffic calming program that we have for 2021, I we started or the team has started to look at what should we do uh, in 2021? And we're kind of leaning towards the potential for a couple more permanent radar feedback signs. Those have been well received by the public. Uh, and if we go that route, I'll have one of our engineers uh, provide an update on recommended locations for the committee to deliberate and select on that one. The 24th Avenue sidewalk, uh, program or project with TIB Midway Elementary. Uh, we're working with TIB on that. We're at 30% design on that. And hopefully we'll try to get into the right-of-way phase later on this fall. So that project is going uh, very, very well. Andrew, I think we need to change the name of that project to the Kaplan Memorial Corridor or something like that. Exactly. And maybe that's why Dave's on the on the meeting today. <laughs> so yes, we are working on that as far as- real, It's real, but, Dave. <laughs> yep, exactly. It's a real project now. Uh, the Barn Street Trail, the south segment, 240th between 16th and 20th, we completed the King County uh, grant that we had, uh, and we're going to be preparing for a TIB grant submittal in August 2021 to get funding to actually go to construction and finish off right away on, on that section of the uh, roadway and trail uh, through there. I've got the uh, 2021 arterial street paving in yellow here, uh, depending on interlocal agreements, which I'll talk about below with some with uh, Lake Haven and Water District 54. I may also look for spot improvements around the city of areas that that just have needed restoration on pavement. Uh, for example, down in Redondo, uh, across from Salties, there's a couple dips in the road that, that have been bugging uh, quite a few people over time. So 
I may look for three or four spot improvements here and there, depending on uh, resources available once I get through the interlocal agreements. Andrew, would that be our people that would do that or would you would you contract that out? No, these are the, the spot improvements uh, probably are valued probably, I'm guessing, fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So all of that would be contracted out and bid okay. out for, for contractors. Uh, a little, little bit too big for our crews to handle. Uh, going going down to the plan construction, uh, back to the North Marina parking lot bulkhead restroom replacement, uh, pending the bids in April coming in and approval of phase one and or phase two uh, combined on that one. Uh, we should be ramping that up uh, mid-summer uh, for construction on that project. That'll be that'll be a big, big lift to get that one done. And then I have planned construction, the interlocal agreement, like I said, with Water District 54, 8th Avenue South. I'm sent over the final edits on that. So I should be receiving something and council should be seeing that I'm hoping within the next month. The same with uh, an interlocal agreement with Lake Haven for Lower Woodmont, water main replacements and paving. I'm hoping to wrap that up within the next month as well too, uh, which would be great two partnerships uh, to get, you know, stretch our dollars further on our local residential roadways. Um, kind of Dan walked through the sound transit, uh, a little bit of 509, we're still supporting those big projects. And uh, just a little quick uh, overview on grants. I have been working on with, with the project team and Brandon on, uh, the 240th Barn Street Trail, 16th to 20th section uh, with that TIB application coming up that I mentioned earlier. We also have applied for uh, capital direct appropriations through the Washington State Legislature for phase two of the North Marina parking lot project, as well as the Redondo Fishing Pier project. Uh, so hopefully those will get some traction. Uh, we'll see where that goes over the next couple of months and hopefully we can get some money out of those as well to advance those forward. Now, uh, back to the Redondo Fishing Pier bulkhead rest and replacement project. We've made some good uh, headway with some preliminary permitting coordination with various federal and state agencies to kind of give us an idea of what we're up against as far as design. And can people see my, is my screen shifting for you guys? Can you see? Yep. yep. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I gave, a, I gave a one sheet kind of illustration here on where we're going as far as kind of setting an expectation on what the fishing pier might look like and how it's gonna feel or function coming up based on the framework that we have to work with in, uh, with permitting agencies, primarily the, the Department of Natural Resources, Washington Fish and Wildlife, and the Army Corps. Uh, overall, when you have a, when you have a, any type of structure, uh, perpendicular to the to the shoreline, you're gonna to have to use grading. And that's more of a Washington Fish and Wildlife RCW on, on having a certain amount of light penetration for uh, salmonoid species, spawning, eelgrass habitat, all of that good stuff, as well as requirements for ADA grading. So what I've what I've kind of shown are some preliminary kind of photos just to kind of give give the committee context a little bit of what those permit requirements allow us to do. And the first, the, the top picture there, including the middle one, kind of show you the, the amount of kind of hard service or concrete compared to the amount of grading that we're allowed to provide for this fishing pier. So it's about a one third, two thirds uh, type of mix between concrete and grading. We're trying to still work with the permitting agencies to try to get more concrete, like a half and half. I don't think we're gonna be able to convince them uh, just because like I said, this is perpendicular to the shoreline and gets close to eelgrass beds out in the water out there. Uh, so, so what we're trying to do with this, with, with the concrete portion through the grading is to really provide a space for, for users uh, predominantly probably more, more elderly folks uh, or those who need assistance next to a railing. So we've kind of really strategically said, okay, if we actually have a hard surface, like a six foot wide concrete sidewalk running down this, let's keep it close to the railing where people can, can use the railing where they can stop and watch without having to navigate uh, grading, which for some can feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so this kind of just gives you, like I said, that visual line 
kind of how much grading versus how much concrete to be expected out there. Uh, Andrew, could, yeah. you, could you expand just a little bit on that grading requirement? I know we've tossed around or DN, DNR has, uh, not DNR, but um, the Corps has mentioned 50% uh, grading, but that really is 50% light penetration at the water. So it requires more than a 50% surface grading, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. And thanks for bringing that up, Brandon. So it's actually not the core. It's actually state uh, state RCWs for fish and wildlife through the state that basically, you know, one, one of the toughest uh, design criteria we have to meet is we need to have at least 50% light penetration of the entire surface area of the structure uh, with whatever it may be, concrete grading, et cetera, 50% light must come through it. But then when we look at the grading itself and we say, okay, here's the grading we want to use. Well, there's criteria on, okay, how much light actually gets through the grading because there is solid surface with the grading now. So when they talk about 50%, it's not just, you know, a square foot area of the footprint. It's actually talking about how much light gets through the facility. So we've been with the design team, we've been trying to manage, okay, with that, with that, framework now how much concrete can we put out there without hamstringing ourselves getting into a grading issue with the light penetration so it's kind of a balance of square footage of of light going through and in, in uh, basically a hard surface where light won't penetrate and kind of coming up with a reasonable solution uh juggling those two factors and that's where we're kind of focusing on a minimum of a of a six foot wide concrete walkway on this fishing pier as well out there to provide some level of comfort instead of just walking on grading out there. And in the middle uh, picture there, I've got a couple of photos of a couple of products and we haven't selected grading. We're still looking at manufacturers. We're still looking at materials, uh, use in marine environments, impact resistance, all of those uh, criteria. But you can kind of see what grading may look like from an ADA perspective on whether we go metal, which is most likely, or we go to a extruded, like say fiberglass or some other product out there. Uh, it kind of just gives you an idea of, of the products and the textures we'll be, we'll be uh, having to work with as part of this project out there. So that's kind of all I had on it was just to kind of provide a visual on, on where the project's kind of headed from a preliminary design perspective. Uh, the team, we're going to be having a couple uh, pretty big uh, environmental kickoff meetings next month with a lot of the permitting agencies to more or less revalidate all of the discussions that are going on now to kind of set the stage to lock in the design and, and get this thing under final design and, and completed out there. But with hey, that, I'm willing to yeah. take any questions anybody has. Hey, hey Andrew, uh, I got a few questions, if you don't mind, then I'll, Matt, and then I'll go to JC. Sure. Um, First one is on this grading, and I see how your design is. I was thinking about functionality for fishermen. Is there a way to do it straight out and then tee it off where you're not going to get lines and crab pots and all kinds of other things caught in the grading? Uh, that's just a maybe a call out. And on the concrete, are you guys using a special blend that's, that's environmentally sensitive that doesn't leach into the waters? Or do yeah, you know so me, better? yeah, so let me tackle both those really quick here. So the orientation of the grading, there's actually rules and regulations on which direction the grading lies. Uh, we haven't got into that uh, design detail uh, quite yet. You know, whether it's shown, shown uh, parallel to the width of the, the fishing pier as it's shown there in the figure, or if it's oriented 90 degrees from there, I don't have that answer clearly, but yeah, that's dictated by, by permitting. Uh, our guess is it's, it's oriented towards how we show it, where it's parallel to the width uh, versus the length. Uh, but we'll definitely keep that as, a, as a, something to think about as we, as we do the final selection of the grading out there. And then yeah. the concrete itself, depending on how the permitting or, or what permit, permit conditions we may, we may be uh, dealing with, my goal structurally on the project for ease of construction is actually to hopefully have most of the concrete elements and the substructure precast off site and brought in. And just like the Redondo boardwalk we built, 
all that concrete uh, pretty much would be would be set at that point in time to where chemicals or whatnot would not be leaching. We don't have any additives we add for saltwater environments uh, or coatings we put on it. So it, it's more just like a concrete curb, like on a roadway. So I wouldn't expect any environmental issues. And most permitting agencies actually really stress moving towards concrete just because it really doesn't have a long-term environmental impact like say uh, galvanized steel or, or uh, any type of treated timber structures. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Mayor, you're next. Yeah, I was just curious about the grading itself, uh, what its life was. Uh, steel and salt water have an, <laughs> an immediate reaction. They usually, when salt water starts to corrode the steel and over time we just, it goes away. And I understand there's various coatings and so forth, but I was just wondering um, when you, you mentioned a variety of different products um, is part of the decision, not only just the product and the light penetration, of course, but um, which would be more in the implementation, but just the life of the product. And if we did go with steel, what would be the anticipated life? Oh, you bet. Yeah, and my, my whole goal with, with any of these green projects is, is to try to maximize the lifespan. And honestly, with the grading, uh, we're most likely going to be looking at an aluminum or aluminum composite just from that durability and lifespan in a marine environment. There's some galvanized products out there, but I get a little edgy on those just, just due to the, the issues and maintenance issues if, if they start rusting. Uh, the composite materials we're still looking into, I don't have a great answer or feel for those, but there's a lot of other considerations that we've got to look at as well for grading uh, impact resistance as waves bring in logs and, you know, bash up underneath this, this fishing pier will be a problem. So there's a lot of different factors, but, but my guess is we'll be more going towards an aluminum type of facility uh, for that longevity and ease of maintenance. And an estimated lifespan over of a product of that nature. I know you can't be exact. Yeah, I don't. Of... I mean, honestly, I haven't looked at the manufacturing uh, data on that. Uh, but with any type of facility with concrete and in, in, in metal like this, I'd hope I'd be shooting for at least thirty plus years uh, for for that material to hold up. Now, as far as impact and you know replacement of of sections as things kind of break or or problems happen that will occur but yeah i mean this this facility we're shooting for 30 plus year lifespan of of everything we build out there okay thank you councilmember harris uh thank you andrew i would i just adding on to what the mayor just said i'm always struck by the short life expectancy of these things you know i i was hoping you would say 50 years or 100 years you know, like we'd never have to, well, no, no, no. You look at, you know, structures in Europe and, you know, they go back a thousand years, no problem. Um, but my, my question, and this might sound really trite, um, I'm worried about vertigo. Um, my kids, my in-laws, they go on bridges like that that have the grating and they look down and it's really annoying to them. And so, you know, maybe I'm the only, you know, they're the only people who have that issue, but um, uh, just just something to think about if there's a way to, uh, you know, just make sure you have it wide enough so that people can comfortably walk on the um, on the part that's not graded. So, yeah, yeah, you bet. That, that's a great point. And, and honestly, I'm not a big fan of grading anywhere over water just from just from the, like you said, the kind of the perception or the feel of it. Uh, you know, the Redondo Boardwalk was an exception. We were able to convince the agencies that we didn't need grading down there, even though they pushed hard for it. Uh, but that was a different, you know, that was parallel to the shoreline and we didn't jut out far at all. So it wasn't really a light issue to, to most permitting agencies. This one is going to be very, very challenging to get away from that. But if there's any opportunity I have to get rid of grading, I'm going to jump on it. Uh, the one there's a few things that we've looked at one is i like the ada grading because it's got a tighter cell structure to it versus say you can use grading down in a, a marina environment for boat access access that doesn't have to be ada and the cells are a lot lot more open and bigger that can cause someone to feel like they're walking over water the ada grading is pretty tight and i'm hoping 
once we select something, I'll be able to get a couple product samples and, and I can get those to you guys just to kind of look at as well. The other option that we did look at, but it was cost prohibitive, was precast concrete with glass inserts, uh, kind of like Seattle did on their on their frontage uh, that they've recently built up there. They they use glass blocks. Uh, the costs were about you know three times more expensive than anything else we looked at. Plus the maintenance of the glass blocks when it comes to impact or replacement. Uh, just looking at what Seattle's gone through was it, it just long term doesn't make sense on having to, you know, spend thousands of dollars trying to get a glass piece in and out if those start cracking or they become non transparent enough for the permitting agencies. Uh, I know that's been an issue on on folks re looking at it and saying, hey, your light projections aren't aren't sufficient here. Uh, I didn't so, want yeah, to go into the weeds, but um, okay, a couple other real quick things. Um, I guested at the uh, Water District 54 yesterday, and um, they just refinanced to get the money for 8th Avenue, and um, they would like you to call them. They thought you were on holiday this week, Andrew. Um, I, yes, they are correct. I'm supposed to be taking some vacation this week, but life just doesn't turn out that way. But no, I actually sent, I sent uh, Eric Clark, uh, the water district, I think yesterday I sent them over an email with the final interlocal agreement and basically just said, let me know if this is good and I'll get it routed through the city administration. Uh, so I'm, yeah, I, I've, I've been in close contact with them over there on this one. I believe it. Uh, so um, just two really quick, do you have uh, any kind of rendering of what 24th Avenue is gonna look like the, uh, next to the schools or is it too early? You, you, it sounded like you were kind of nearing the, you know, design, design phase where you might have a picture. Yeah, we just we just hit 30 percent design and we're going through review on that right now. But what I can do is as we start kicking off from 30 to 90 percent design, I'll uh, try to get a rendering or, or a nice urban design graphic together that kind of shows the cross section and kind of what the road will look like in general, visually. Uh, just because we're not going to have planters out there. If you think of 216, the segment right in front of Wesley Homes that has the sidewalks, bike lanes without the planters, it's going to look kind of similar to that three lane road section right through there. But I'll work on, I'll see what we can do uh, and I'll keep you updated on that. No, you just answered it. That's that's really good. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, pothole filling 250th. Um, thank you. All right. Dan, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, going back to the fishing pier, um, I know Brandon and Andrew have been working with Anthony. We've got our legislative ask in on that. You know, if we don't get an appropriation on this, um, you know, we'll be able to continue through the permitting and design efforts, but, um, you know, this project is going to need construction funding um, and we're going to need it from outside sources. Uh, so we're, we'll keep working on that. I uh, just want to, you know, make make that point that we have the design money, but we don't have the the construction money on this project. So yeah. I think our ask is two million. Is that correct for the fishing pier with the yeah, state, we asked, Andrew? We asked for two million for for construction, which would which would uh, you know support partial concrete, partial grading with a concrete and steel substructure. Uh, to get us a nice long, long life uh, structure out there. But, but our priority ask is the uh, phase two bulkhead, and that's 4.4, just so everyone's aware. So that's where, yeah, the bulkhead, moving the bathrooms and things like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, with, go ahead. Do we have any more comments or questions? With that being said, do I have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn, all those in favor? Aye. All right, thank you guys, great work. Thanks. Thank you. Yep, thank you.